Well, I'm Kayla Brantley. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Nate Parker, Keydron Bryant. I just watched American Skin and it's such an incredible movie. I think it's such an important film, especially with everything going on right now. It's a very timely film. But Nate, if I'm not mistaken, you started this whole project years ago before George Floyd, before Breonna Taylor, before Ahmaud Aubrey. Um, can you tell us about that timeline and what initially sparked this? Absolutely. Um, I wrote the film two years ago, and really it was in response to my relationship with my nephew, who when I uh, took him into my home uh, to live with us, he was about Kidron's age. And, uh, you know, and bringing, taking him out of a, a community that was in so many ways broken, you know, where I came from in, in Portsmouth, Virginia, bringing him here to California to give him a better opportunity at an, an education, I thought this is the best thing for him, he's fine, uh, but he had to ride his bike to school every day. And when Michael Brown got killed, he came to me and said, Uncle Nate, if I get pulled over on my bike, what do I do? And I realized in that moment for all of my activism, for all the work I was doing, I didn't have an answer for my nephew that was acceptable. You know, I said, you know, well, call me and I'll come and meet you where you are. And then I said, oh, well, don't use the phone. Uh, don't reach for your phone. You know, just get off the bike slowly, put your hands up in the air, make sure they're, they can, you make eye contact so they can see your humanity. And I realized very quickly, I was, I was traumatizing him with a, with a conversation around engagement with a, a, a public servant that, you know, our taxes pay for. And it really just, pushed me to create a piece of art that could really force the conversation around policing and the, and the exploitation and the subjugation around how black bodies are, are, are destroyed. And so in a strange way, even not knowing I would be uh, in connection with Kidron, um, it was, you know, in making this film for my nephew, I was making it also for him. Yeah, and Kidron, you're obviously of that age. Are there any lessons maybe or things that you've learned from this film? Um, well, I actually have, haven't watched it yet. I haven't watched the film yet, but I, I'm looking forward to watching it. And um, I believe that it's definitely a powerful movie just by looking at the trailer and um, by all the the cast and um, the team. So I, I, I really want to watch it. And just around um, this time that we're going through, that movie I think is definitely needed um, because of all the killings and the racism and police brutality that's been going on in America. And Kidron, you sing I Know I've Been Changed from uh, the film. It's on the soundtrack. Can you tell us a little bit about that song? Yes. So I... um. I sung I Know I've Been Changed featuring um, Simba and Gary Clark Jr. And I really had an amazing time in the studio recording that song because um, that's, I like, I, I really love gospel music and I like songs that have powerful messages and really speak to um, just like the culture and just to make change in this world. So I definitely had an amazing time recording that song and I'm so grateful for that. <laughs> Nate, did you have the chance to speak to any families of the victims of police brutality while conducting your research? Absolutely. Uh, in my research, I not only sp spoke with family members, I also sp spoke with various members of law, law enforcement uh, to really get an accurate uh, 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 dialogue, you know, um, I, I think that with the things that are happening, there's no need to dramatize anything. You know, all you need, really need to do is represent the actual raw emotional feelings that these people are, are having who have lost their ch their children or their husbands or their daughters or mothers. Um, I think that's, that is, is where we are. You know, I've had a, the chance to screen the film for a number of parents who uh, have been the victim of these, these, these killings. Uh, and what you find are people who have not healed and they haven't healed because America has not really engaged in a way uh, to create reconciliation around these, 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 the, the, the takings of these lives. And I think that uh, my hope for the film is that it can be a jump off point for a real conversation around this you know when you look at someone like Idran who is young and so remarkably gifted in ways that I've seen so few since back when Stevie Wonder was singing it at that age uh, you can only think to yourself what will he do 
You know, what, what, are we, what is the world that we're handing off to him as he leaves his house? This tremendous talent um, that, that is in danger of being cut short if we don't do our jobs as journalists, as art artists, if we don't contribute to the conversation of making his life more safe the next time and, 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 and as he walks into the world. When you think about Trayvon Martin's family, or you think about Michael Brown's father, or these, these, as we do this interview, they're somewhere hurting right now, thinking about the loss of their loved one. Uh, and until we really confront it in a way that is meaningful, um, I think that we're gonna continue this, this cycle. And one thing that I think was done so remarkably well um, is that you did show both sides. And like you said, you spoke to cops as well as the families of the victims of police brutality. And I think it's just something that's so important. What was that process like and how important was it for you to be able to kind of step outside of the situation and portray both sides? Because sometimes, you know, conversations are very one-sided. True, true. Well, you know, I've always been uh, thrown by the idea that uh, you know a police officer can have one of these shootings and then could just disappear and come back in two weeks and deliver some canned statement uh, about uh, the incident when the people that were there in the moment that, that aren't police have to give uh, an eyewitness account in the moment. Um, and so I thought to myself, if I could force a person or create an environment whereby one of these law officers could really talk about what's on their mind when these things happen or even proceeding, you know, uh, when you, when, you know we, we always hear about uh, racial profiling, um, but we don't really learn about how it happens, you know? And so and it's funny because I talked to some of these police officers and some of them, you know, I've known, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've you know, their kids have gone to school with my kids. And, you, and you've gone to barbecues at their house, but then when you sit and talk to them about policing, it's as if they shift into another human being, you know? And I had a lot of you know, police officers talk to me under the condition of anonymity, but they said, you know, any police that doesn't tell you that, that at some point of their, their day, they're not profiling, they're not telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, they said that there, there, there are things that we learn to do that help us identify and create safer environments. And this is what they're saying. Um, and there, you know, I, I had a, one police officer talk to me about the difference between, you know, administrative policing and criminal policing, you know, and how, you know, when you're an administrative policing, you're, you're how, how are you, ma'am? Thank you, you're welcome, uh, I'm sorry, or whatever. But when criminal policing, it's get the F out of the car and get the F on the curb. And I remember asking this particular officer, I was like, well, is that in like a manual or handbook? And he says, no, it's just, it's just the way it is. So I think that there, until we have those conversations, um, it's gonna be very difficult for us to get to the root. We'll constantly be de dealing with symptoms rather than dealing with the true sickness um, that, that, that is ingrained and pervasive uh, in the training uh, of, of law enforcement. John, you've had such an incredible year. Um, especially after going viral with um, I Just Want to Live. It was such a heartfelt song that came at such an important moment. And, you know, you attracted the attention of LeBron James, Oprah Winfrey, and Barack Obama. How crazy was that for you? And were you super excited and, you know, to get signed? You have so much going for you. Is there anything that we can expect next from you? So, yes, um, it's definitely been a great journey. Um, since I went viral and my song, I Just Want to Live, um, I got to record it actually. And I, um, of, of course, I landed a record deal and um, just this whole music journey has just been an amazing journey. I'm so blessed to have this gift that I have. And um, you can expect a lot of things from me. I'm actually in LA right now um, recording some music in the studio um, in some more content and music videos. So you can expect some, a lot of collabs and just a lot of amazing things that's gonna be coming up in the future.
Mm-hmm. Well, that's really exciting. You're definitely one to watch. I'll be looking out for you. Um, and Nate, you're also, you star in this film, but you are also the director, writer. I've always had this question for directors who are also acting in this film. How does that work? Could you kind of break it down? Are you like in the middle of a dramatic scene and then you're yelling cut to yourself? Like, explain that for me. It, it, you know, it's one of those things where I don't always plan to be the writer or director. It's just the job has to get done, you know? So you find yourself like, well, I guess I'll do it. You know, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, you just got to do it. You know, it, it, it's, you, you try not to make too much of it because if you get too self-critical, then you get insecure and then you're like, how did I do? But the way I do it is um, I try to create an environment with my actors where it feels organic. You know, I let everyone take their own cues. I don't often, often call cut. I'll say, you know, whenever you guys are ready uh, and we'll walk into a scene, not feeling like we were prompted, but bringing the energy of what we feel that character wants to bring. And then when we're done, I kind of just let the, 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 the scene die on its own. Uh, and then I either go to the monitor. If I feel like I, if it's my coverage, I usually don't look at it. I just keep it moving. Um, but you know, it's, you keep the pace and you, you know, you do, it's, it's kind of like singing, you know what I mean? Kidron is, is remarkable and, and, I, and I'd imagine when he's singing, he sings, it's from his soul. And when he's done, he knows he's done. And, and he pro- and, um, and you can speak to this, Kidron, you probably know when you need another one, like if it didn't, you, it didn't work right, or, you know, let me do that again, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely like that in the studio, um, because um, you have to like really know that for yourself that you felt what you just did. And um, you just can't put anything out there without um, a, a powerful message and you definitely delivering it the right way so it could come across to your audience um, the same way that you felt and that you can connect with them. So it's definitely like that in the studio. Mm-hmm. And Nate, um, the title, how did you get American Skin? Well, initially it was a feeling, you know, before we had a, um, a title, uh, what I was wanting to do is, you know, initially I was like, I'm going to make a documentary type type feel, just put it out and let people in different spaces who may not know who I am, not know if it's real or it's not. Uh, but through the conversations we were having around it, it, this whole idea of what does it mean to be um, an American citizen and what does it mean to have equity? I mean, we're, we're seeing the double standard in policing in just the last couple of weeks and how depending on what you look like in your background, in your, in your color, uh, in your culture, uh, the chances of you living, the chances of you being uh, escorted out rather than being taken out uh, varies. Uh, so, you know, that whole idea of what it means to be American or what, is it, what it means to be three-fifths of a person and now hopefully regarded as a full human being, that's where the title came from. When you think of what American skin looks like, you know, we, right now we have three different, you know, you know, we have more than one culture represented even on this call, you know, and are we all American or is an American person a person that just has peach skin, blonde hair and blue eyes? So it really calls into question, uh, what does it mean to be Ameri- American? Because if we can define that and we can really plant that flag, uh, I think we can work our way backwards into creating equity around that definition because we're not there yet. Um, you know, obviously Bruce Springsteen has the, the song 41 Shots that said that's about uh, uh, Amadou Diallo and, and I'm very aware, aware of that, um, that title as well. So it just felt right. It felt like it was in the air. And, uh, and then when, that, when I realized that that was the, 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 the words he used in that song as well, it just, it just had synergy. It just felt like the right title for the right movie for the right time. This film has so many different layers and so many different lessons. Is there just one takeaway that you would want, you know, if you'd get nothing from it, but one thing for people of any, any color, any background, any creed, what would that be? To save one life, you know, like this film is not the savior for black people in America. It just, I mean, there are people that do that work every single day and I respect them and I would not patronize them as to think that a movie could do the work that they do because they're they're doing the you're a journalist you're doing the work every day this is just a contributor to the conversation but my hope with this small fraction of 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 of, uh, a solution or or help that's driving the solution is that some cop somewhere at some point after seeing this film approaches a car differently 
uh, and can say after driving away and whoever he engaged with drove away saying, you know what, when he got out of the car with that cell phone, I, all, you know, I felt myself de-escalate because I thought about that film. I mean, this is, I mean, you're 13 now? Yes. Yeah. We have a 13 year old, right? Talking about being in the studio with these fantastic artists, talking about being assigned, you know what I mean? All these fantastic people around the world recognizing his work. We cannot let him and his work and his life be cut short for any reason. We have to change this whole paradigm so we can know that Key Drawn, 50 years from now, will have had a legacy like a Stevie Wonder because we made it safer for him. So the one thing I want for this film is it for, to save a life, to make, some, to make a, a cop take a beat, for us to have solidarity around forcing conversations that need to be had in America. That's extremely, extremely profound. I think the movie's so important. I can't wait for it to come out and for everyone else to see. I watch it with my family and we had a whole conversation after it. Um, and I think it's just the start of a way bigger conversation. Uh, so congratulations, Nate. Congratulations, Kidron. And uh, best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you.